Hello and welcome to Sake Revolution, America's first sake podcast. I'm your host, John Puma from the SakeNotes.com and also the administrator of the Internet Sake Discord. And I'm your host, Timothy Sullivan. I'm a sake samurai, sake educator, as well as the founder of the Urban Sake website. And together, John and I will be tasting and chatting about all things sake and doing our best to make it fun and easy to understand. So you know, John, today's a special day. You and I have something to celebrate. I know. And I'll, honestly, Tim, I didn't realize you were a football fan. But yeah, the season did start. Uh, this no, 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 no. This is not football. Uh, do you do you don't is, know what today is? Oh, uh, is is Okonomiura opening up a New York City branch? That's a little. <laughs> I think it's a little ambitious, but you know, I, I think that four stories of Okonomiyaki, you know, maybe it has a place here in New York. No, John. No, I can't believe you don't know this, but today is our twenty fifth episode of Sake Revolution. Wait, bum, 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 bum. We, we've done this 25 <laughs> times? Yes. This is our 25th episode. I think that's a big milestone. Yeah, I think it might be. And we should probably celebrate. But how do you celebrate a sake podcast? Well, I think there's only one thing that's going to fit the bill this week. We're going to have to go for sparkling sake. Ooh, okay. Sparkling sake. All right. I mean, yes. I, I know about it. I'm not a foremost expert. Uh, I don't have a lot of experience. You're going to you got to educate me a bit on this one. Perhaps the Sake Education Corner would be the right place for that. Well, let's mosey on over to the Sake <laughs> Education Corner. Ah, spacious. My couch is exactly where I left it. <laughs> so comfortable over it here. Is, I, just, it I is love it. Very comfortable. <laughs> well, when I think about sparkling sake, you and I have both been drinking sake for many years, well over a decade. And when we first got into sake, sparkling sake was not what it is today. It used to be very, very different. Do you remember your first experience with sparkling sake? Uh, not exactly. I'm going to say I probably don't remember what my literal first experience was. But I do remember, uh, honestly, just being like, you know, maybe this isn't for me. And <laughs> my wife being very much, uh, this is for me. Uh, and so she very much enjoys that. And that fits into crazy style somehow. And yeah. she's the expert in the house. Well, there's been a big transition in the industry in regards to sparkling sake. When it first made an appearance, sparkling sake was not something that had a lot of prestige in the industry. Mm. It was produced as something that was very low in alcohol high in sugar, very often extremely sweet. Mm. And they would do CO2 injection, which means that they would pump the bubbles into the sake like you're making seltzer or Coca-Cola or something like that. And very often the bottles would be frosted pink and marketed to women. So it was this sweet, sticky, low alcohol concoction that did not have a lot of prestige in the industry. That's how things started out. There was a big shift in the perception of sparkling sake around 2016. Mm -hmm. There was the founding of what's called the Japan Awasake Association. So nine brewers got together and they wanted to create an association that was dedicated to upping the game mm -hmm. and creating what we now understand as premium sparkling sake. Now, for the for those of us who are not familiar with that uh, either term or acronym, what exactly mm. is awa? Awa means bubble or foam in Japanese. And uh. it's a word that is often used to refer to sparkling sake. The technical term, there's a there's a, another word you can use called haposhu. Haposhu. Haposhu, okay. ha, haposhu means like sparkling sake. But awa is often used nowadays to refer to sparkling. So you can say awa sake or awa sake. And uh, this association started in the hopes of codifying a way of making premium sparkling sake. So they have certain rules and regulations that you have to follow mm -hmm. to become a member in this group. And then if you're a member, you can put a special sticker on your bottle and you qualify for a certain status and you create a premium sparkling product. And the primary difference between premium sparkling sakes and all the rest are how you get the bubbles in there. If you do a secondary in-bottle fermentation, 
like champagne or if you inject the bubbles in like you're making seltzer or soda or something. All right. And I imagine that, well, I imagine that if they went through all the trouble of codifying it to helpfully lean a little more towards towards doing it in the bottle, is there a difference? Is there a major difference in the way that in the finished product? Obviously, there's a, way, there's a difference in the way the bubbles get there. But what's that really going to mean as far as me sipping my sparkling sake in a little while? Yeah, you know, the bubbles are CO2, carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. and I thought CO2 is CO2. What's the big That's deal? That's exactly what was going through my head. Yeah, but it's the size of the bubble. Size matters, John. It's, it's, it's not the motion of the ocean. <laughs> it's the size of the bubble. So sparkling sake made with in-bottle fermentation creates a very, very fine bubble. Mm. And if you think about bubbles in a fine champagne. You pour champagne into a glass, you get these little streams of bubbles going up the glass. Right, right. If you pour seltzer into a glass, you get these big, large bubbles. That's the difference that you primarily notice. And the texture on your tongue, you can really feel the difference. So uh, that small, very fine bubble is highly prized in the world of secondary fermentation. So that's really what they're going for. And that is uh, the key differentiator in my book that you can tell the difference between a champagne style sparkling sake mm -hmm. and a CO2 injected sparkling sake. All right, all right. What else do we need to know about this going in? I've had champagne, I've had sparkling wine. What's sparkling sake gonna be a little different from other sakes I've had apart from, you know, there's bubbles. Yeah, well, it's interesting. I, I know some of the breweries that have been working on making premium sparkling sake, and they had to look at the champagne method for getting bubbles into alcohol. Mm -hmm. They had to kind of deconstruct it and then apply it to the sake production method. So it's really interesting. What I thought we might talk about just a little bit is how do they get the bubbles in there in the first place? All right. What's happening? And in the world of sparkling wine, when you make champagne, it's actually called the champagne method. Mm -hmm. What you do is you make a premium still wine, so there's no bubbles in it, but you ferment a wine. Then you put the wine into the bottle. And then in the bottle, you add what's called liqueur de tirage, which is a uh, mixture of wine, sugar, and yeast. Mm, okay. And these three things blend together, and they put that in the bottle and seal it up. And that yeast and sugar kicks off a secondary fermentation in the bottle. So that's what they do to get champagne or sparkling wine. So in the world of sake, for premium sake, no additions of sugar are allowed. Yeah, uh, that's that's a thing. I remember yeah. us talking about yeah. that in previous episodes. That if we're adding sugar, we're, we're no longer making sake. And that, if I'm not mistaken, sake is in a place where there's there, the sugars aren't there we have to do things to the rice to make the sugars happen it's not like grapes where you just right there it is so what do we yes. what, how are we doing this this seems like a puzzle box that is very difficult yes. to get through yes if we were to add sugar to this we could not sell it legally as premium sake in japan those additives are not allowed mm -hmm. so what do we do well what they do is they take a premium still sake so up to that point, things are the same. They make a premium version of the sake they want sparkling, mm -hmm. and they take a still version of it. They put it in a bottle, and instead of adding yeast and sugar, they take Moromi mash. So do you remember Moromi? They take some active fermentation mash, and that liquid has koji. Mm -hmm. It has regular rice. It has water, and it has some active yeast in there as well. So this is an active fermentation mash. They take a scoop of that. It goes into the bottle with the finished sake. They seal it up. And that that moromi that's in there kicks off a secondary fermentation. So instead of adding yeast and sugar, they're adding live moromi. Which will turn their carbohydrates into sugar, which will then kick off secondary fermentation inside the bottle. Yes. That's... So you've got all the ingredients you need. Who came up with that? That's great. <laughs> Isn't that's, that amazing? That's, that's phenomenal. <laughs> and then the other big difference is that in the world of sake, we do this secondary in-bottle fermentation for about two months. Mm -hmm. In the world of champagne, it can be a minimum of 15 months up to several years. Wow. They let the wine hang out for a long time. 
But sake is a different animal. Sake is generally meant to be consumed young and fresh, so we get two months of this secondary fermentation, and then we're going to disgorge and then remove the dead yeast, and then we'll get a clear sparkling sake. So they have to filter it in some way after the fact. Well, they do what's called riddling, which is the same as the wine world, oh. where they slowly tip the bottle upside down so it's inverted with the uh, neck of the bottle facing down. All the dead yeast falls into the neck, and then when they open it, the force of the bubbles is going to push all the dead yeast out, and then they can seal it with the final closure. Okay, that makes sense. And that gives us a clear sparkling sake. Fantastic. Well, I'm all for education, but I think, bear with me here, I think we might need some hands-on. Words are only going to take us exactly. so far, Exactly. I think it's time for hands-on <laughs> uh, hands experience. We need to taste this. This sake. And also, once again, celebrate 25, 25 episodes. And that's, honestly, guys, it's not counting the ones we did to test out things in the beginning and trying to figure out how we were doing podcasts. And then there's this other thing we tried to do in Japan that totally didn't work out the way we wanted to. But <laughs> that involves sparkling sake, didn't it? <laughs> We've recorded well over 25 yeah, yeah. episodes. Guys, that's the inside baseball. It's how it works. It, everything that makes it to the broadcast isn't everything that gets made. That's kind of <laughs> how it works. Um, so let's introduce our sakes. What sparkling did you bring to the table, so John? I brought a sparkling sake from one of my favorite brands slash breweries. So it's Imada uh, Fukujo. And this is their seaside sparkling Junmai. Imada Shuzo is in... Hiroshima, which is, uh, we're big fans, and as you might have noticed from the last episode. And this was, Imada-san wanted to make a sparkling sake, and so she went for it and made this very, very interesting, very different sparkling sake, which we'll get into when we start tasting. Tim, what did you bring? All right. Well, I brought a very special sake for me. This is Hakai-san Awa, Junmai Ginjo sparkling sake. So Hakai-san, again, is where I lived for one year and where I did my brewing internship. And Hakai-san was one of the founding members of that Japan Awasaki Association I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So they've been creating champagne method sparkling sake since 2016. Uh, so I got to work on this when I was living at the brewery. So I thought I would bring some Hakai-san and we can both taste our champagne method sparklings. Nice. I, you you worked on the Awa while you were there? I didn't realize that. Yes, I did. It's wonderful. They had me do pretty much every job in the brewery. So I got to spend a few weeks here, a few weeks there, a few weeks there. And part of what I did was working on batches of the sparkling. Nice. So one of the first things I'm noticing when I'm picking up my bottle is that this actually is a little bit cloudy. Now, what's interesting, though, is that this is not a sparkling nigori. The cloud is actually uh, is actually like leftover yeast, probably from the uh, process you were describing earlier. Yes, yes, I'm sure yeah. it is. Yeah, which I, I always I found very fascinating when I was researching this. I was like, oh, all right, it's cloudy, but it's not nigori. Okay, let's see what this is all about. And if you don't mind, yeah. I'm gonna pop it open. Go for right. it. Hopefully, I didn't disturb this thing too much. Oh, jeez. Well. While we let, while we wait for John's bottle to settle, uh, Tim, why don't you open yours? No, you have to keep going. Oh, I have to keep going. Uh, for yes. those at so, home who are not seeing what's going on here, uh, it uh, almost poured almost, out onto my almost desk. Almost over. <laughs> Did not do so. I got the cap back on time. This is a slow and steady wins yeah, the race. This is a very delicate procedure. Don't try this at home. Okay. All right. And you're working with a screw I cap. I am working with a screw cap. Yeah. All right. It is open. And since I opened the cap, there is just a just an unbelievable amount of bubbles just shooting to the top of this. Uh, and I haven't done anything with this. I haven't poured it. I haven't really disturbed it. All I did right. was open the top and it is just going. It is. This is lively. I can tell you from a technical point of view a little bit of what's happening. When CO2 is trapped in the liquid, mm -hmm. it's looking for an exit point. And all those little bits of dead yeast and all that little uh, sediment that's in there is giving it an exit point. So 
those are all sources of bubbles escaping. So that's why a kind of a cloudy style sparkling is much more active when you open it than a clear one. Yeah, this is this is bonkers. I don't think I've ever seen one that was quite reacting like this. This is wonderful. A very different experience. All right, I'm going to pour some of this into my flute. We bust out the good crystal tonight. Yes, that's a beautiful flute. This was a, a wedding gift, Tim. Hmm. So one thing I'm, uh, the first thing I'm getting on this on is on the nose. It is pretty sweet smelling. Hmm. Uh, it's got an SMV of minus three, so it's not that sweet. Um, and I should mention that the same my boy is 70% on this June Mai. And the rice type is one I'm not familiar with. It's called uh, Nakate Shinsenbon, which is a little bit of a mouthful, but is, you know, I mean, it's it's no gyohak. It's no, see, it's really hard to say that. Gohyaku Mangoku, but it is still a mouthful. <laughs> This is a lot more mild than I was expecting. A little bit fruity. The uh, the sparkling aspect definitely massages the tongue while you're tasting it, which is hmm. it adds another bit of tactile sensation. It's adding more, I guess. I guess this just gets filed under texture. Mm hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And you may want to think about the size of the bubbles. Like if you sip on seltzer sparkling water or coca-cola mm. and you feel that sparkle on your tongue is this should this might be a finer sensation than that mm. i don't generally like seltzer i don't like hard seltzers um and it's partially because i don't like the sensation of those bubbles uh, this is a very yeah. different thing this is a more gentle sort of uh sparkling this is very soft very light and a little bit of apple and I'm just, the thing I'm focusing on so much when I'm tasting this is, yes, the flavor is there and it's very pleasant, but the way these bubbles are reacting inside my mouth is so interesting and so different. I have to change my mind a little bit about sparkling sake, Tim. <laughs> There's some good ones out there, I'm telling you. Hmm. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, so some things I've read about your sake are that indeed, Imada-san is doing a secondary in bottle fermentation, so it's an all natural sparkle. But one unique thing that she's doing is she's using white koji in making. Yeah, that all right. So Tim, we talked about koji. We talked. We had a whole episode about koji. <laughs> I don't recall a white koji uh, coming up. I actually don't recall color being a tremendously huge uh, factor when we were discussing it. What's special about white koji? And why is it special if she's using it in this sake? What's it bring to the table? Well, there's actually three kinds of koji. Mm. There's yellow koji, white koji, and black koji. So the standard koji that's used for almost all sake is yellow koji. So that's the industry standard for making sake. White koji is traditionally used for shochu, which is a distilled beverage in Japan. And black koji is used for awamori, which is from Okinawa. It's a distilled spirit from Okinawa. Right. It's a kind of a, like a cousin of shochu in a way, right? Exactly. Okay. Uh, black koji is a mutant of white koji. Ooh. Well, what, what you can do is if you use white koji to make sake or use some white koji, I think she doesn't blend. She uses some yellow and some mm -hmm. white. Uh, it adds... Uh, different flavors. And I think in the case of white koji, you can look for notes of citrus or citric acid or a little bit of that citrus flavor. And I don't know if you're picking up on any of that. I can believe that. <laughs> it's one of those situations <laughs> where you're tasting something for the first time and you're really trying to process it. And then somebody says something, you're like, that's what that is. Yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a little apple. And then there's, I want to say it's like on the finish really that the citrus, hmm. and it's not like you're not, it's not like a, like a grapefruit. It's like very, very, very subtle, but just a little bit of that citrus. It's, yeah, okay. Yeah. It's like putting a squeeze of lemon in a sauce. Like the last thing you do is sometimes you put a squeeze of lemon in a sauce just to brighten mm -hmm. it up. And I think that might come across like that in this sparkling sake you have. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this a lot more than I was expecting. Awesome. New things every day. We try new sakes for science yeah. and sometimes we actually love them. Yeah, I think some people might see your sake has an SMV of minus three. Again, that's the measurement of how sweet or dry. 
Is it coming across as uh, overtly sweet on the palate? Not really. It's also, I mean, it's almost neutral. It's a little bit sweet. It's not, you know, it's not like a lot of champagnes you get are very dry. This is definitely not in that realm, but it's also not aggressively sweet. It's kind of, uh, you know, I mean, it is just a tiny bit sweet. Not not bad. Mm. A little high in the acidity, though. It's um, 3.5. That's very Yeah, high. I know. I was understating slightly for effect. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's 3.5, <laughs> which I believe we talked about just last week and how high acidity can come across as dryness. And maybe that's counteracting that minus three on the uh, SMV. And that's why this is kind of neutral. <laughs> yep. Yeah, very nice. Now, I've gushed about this long enough, I think. Mm. Tim, let's take some of that sake out that you helped make, theoretically. Now, I don't know. When was that? Well, when was maybe that bottle? Not this bottle, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a Hakai san Awa, and this is their champagne method sparkling. Now, this has a seal like you're going to find on a sparkling wine. So, John, you had a screw I cap. Did. I said a regular screw cap. I and have... this, yours looks like, like a champagne top almost. Yes. So yeah. I have a foil, which I'm taking off. Oh, and under the, under the foil, guys, it is a legitimate, is a, there's a champagne looking cork and the little, uh, the, the little metal uh, cage that keeps the cork in. Is there a good yep. name for that, Tim? Do you know that? It's called the cage. Oh, there you go. I got it in one. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So there's a real cork and that uh, metal cage, twisted metal cage. And uh, this is under pressure, we have five atmospheres of pressure, which is very similar to sparkling mm. wine. And um, when you open this, you have to be a little bit careful. And you have to make sure that you apply downward pressure to the cork when you're releasing the cage, because if it wants to, it can pop off. Unexpectedly. I've had that experience with sparkling wine before. It's always a exciting surprise when that happens. All right. All right, and now I'm going to pour into my glass. I have a coupe-style glass. Ooh, very nice. You can hear the bubbles. So this pours very, very clear. Yeah, that's the opposite of mine. One of the differences between our two sparkling sakes, mine was disgorged, meaning, again, they inverted it, got all that yeast residue in the neck, and then removed that. It looks like your sake, they left that they in did. there as a little bit of sediment. So I'm going to give this a smell. Okay, so I'm picking up on notes of melon, a little bit of fruitiness, mm, very gentle aroma. Mm. Mm. Wow. So on the palate, this has a little note of a melon up front. Mm. Tastes a little bit like fruit salad. There's a little bit of sweetness. But then the finish is dry and crisp. Nice. So the acidity on my sake, yours was 3.5. Mine is only 1.4. And the SMV on my Hakai San Awa is minus 5. Uh, yours was minus 3, again, for comparison. And one bigger difference between our two sakes is that mine has a milling rate of 50% remaining. And yours has 70% yeah, it's remaining. way up there. Yeah, so I think that gives this definitely a, a lighter edge. And it feels very much like sparkling wine. I feel very celebratory holding this glass. Well, I mean, you know, again, we have cause for celebration. I think we have to do a compai. Whoa. We usually do our compai at the end, but... <laughs> yes, All right. Okay, I'm here. Should. I'm, I'm, I'm willing. Let me just let me pour a little bit more in. All right, Tim. All right. Well, congratulations. To 25 episodes. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're not done yet. Don't go yes. anywhere. But uh, <laughs> come pie. Cheers. Come pie. So, you know, pairing sparkling sakes with food can be a bit of a conundrum for some people. I would have a really hard time trying to pair this with something. Yeah. Well... The safest way to go is just don't pair it with anything and drink it as an aperitif or have it as a celebratory sake before you get onto the meal. I looked up the definition of aperitif recently, and it's a alcoholic drink consumed to 
increase appetite for a meal or something okay. like that. So it's a <laughs> it's something you drink before uh, you get started eating to kind of get your appetite ready. And I think that these types of sakes are really perfect for that. And they're both low alcohol. Yours and mine are both 13% yeah, alcohol. So, so for sake, that's on the low side. Yeah, we can drink a whole lot of this and not worry about getting too drunk. I do have a question about your sake, though, Tim. I'm looking at the notes, and I see under rice type, and I'm used to seeing occasionally two rices, usually. You know, sometimes if a brewery might want to use one rice for the koji and a different rice for the main mash, this has three this is a Gohyaku Mankoku, Miyamanishiki, mm -hmm. and Yamanishiki. How are, what's going on here? What, what are they doing? Yeah, so they're using Yamada Nishiki for the koji rice, and then for the kake mai or the starch component rice, as you just said, they're using three types, Gohyaku Mankoku, Miyamanishiki, and Yamada Nishiki. And I wondered the exact same thing, and having worked at the brewery for a year, I had the opportunity to walk over to the master brewer and ask him directly. <laughs> and I said, why are you using a blend of three rices? And this is honest to God, this is the answer. I'm ready. He said, well, we tried a whole bunch of combinations and this is the one we liked best. I mean, that's a practical, that's <laughs> a very practical answer. I'm that's impressed it. that the, there's yeah. no witchcraft involved. It was just like, yeah, we tried other things. This is the one. <laughs> That's yeah, great. there's no sorcery. There's no like uh, magic recipe. I think that they wanted a complexity, mm -hmm. like a, a, a bit of a depth of flavor, yeah. not making it too simple or straightforward. And I think one way to achieve that is to blend rice types for the starch component. Now, there, I mentioned they're using 100% Yamada Nishiki for the koji. And I think that when you use different rice types for that starch component, you can add a few layers into the, the overall impression of the sake. I think that's what's going on. When you have a lighter alcohol, you have to look to other places to get a little more depth, a little more nuance. Nice. Uh, I kind of wish yeah. I got to try this. I believe I, have, I might have had the awa one time quite a while ago. Of course, everything feels yeah. like quite a while ago these days. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> And, but I do find myself really enjoying the seaside mm. and stuff. I think I read somewhere that Imada-san, they decided to name it seaside because they wanted people to pair it with seafood and things that come from the ocean. Mm. She has a second line of sake in Japan called seafood, which I imagine has a very similar thought to it. It's not a sparkling variety mm -hmm. so i like that she kind of keeps uh a nautical theme with some of her sake naming could you could you imagine eating some seafood with that uh, i am so inexperienced at, at drinking sparkling beverages of this type with food uh, that I, I i couldn't even venture a guess right now well when i do pairing dinners for hawkeye san mm -hmm. and we have the full lineup of all the sakes to choose from. Almost always, we start with a sparkling as a welcome drink. I think that's fair. And also, you know, there's there's a certain, yeah. as we mentioned earlier, and, and the reason we're drinking this today, there is a a thought of, of celebration that goes with, with sparkling beverages in general. So, you know, coming in and having people be used to a champagne toast, perhaps, and then you, you're giving them... Uh, sparkling sake right off the bat. You're setting the mood. You're saying that we can that sake can party like champagne does, and and here it is. Well, thanks so much to all our listeners for tuning in. We really do hope that you're enjoying our show. If you'd like to show your support for Sake Revolution, one way you can help us out would be to take a couple of minutes and leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. It's one of the best ways you can help us get the word out about our show. Also, be sure to subscribe wherever you download your podcast and then tell a friend and then get them subscribed too. That's how we grow the uh, user base. That's how we get more people listening to Sake Revolution. And as always, to learn more about any of the topics or sakes that we talked about in today's episode, be sure to visit our website, sakerevolution.com for all the detailed show notes. And if you have questions like why is yellow koji used more than white koji or black koji or what does black koji really <laughs> taste like or anything like that please send us those questions to feedback at sakerevolution.com so that tim can answer them on a later episode 
So until next time, please keep drinking sake, keep listening to our show, and to another, at least another 25 episodes, Tim. Thank you very much. I'll drink to that. <laughs> drink to that. Come, Come on. on.